Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for The Art of Motion, performing and acting for games and film. We're so happy that you could join us. And uh, we hope that this panel is beneficial to you because we are all happy to have you here. So before we get started, let's meet our um, awesome panelists. Um, so I am going to be the moderator for your panel. My name is Carmen Asperniz. I'm a game writer. And uh, I'm going to toss it to uh, Marta. Oh, hi. First one up. Hi, everyone. I'm Marta Svetek. I'm an actress. I also work in visual effects uh, when I'm not acting. So I kind of live both behind the computer and kind of in front of the camera. Um, so it's always a fun time. That's me. Who's next? Tom? Hi, I'm Tom Keegan. I am a performance director. Um, I've been working in the field since 1998 in games specifically. Uh, I've done many narrative games. I do the Wolfenstein games. I've done several Star Wars games, Resident Evil 2 and others, and um, love working with performers. Awesome. Bobby? Hey, I'm Bobby, uh, animation director uh, and uh, animation and cinematic director at Insomniac Games. We did uh, Spider-Man for PS4 and it was pretty fun and people liked it. So, I don't know. Awesome. Uh, Zushi? Hi, guys. I'm Zuzsa Narac. I'm from Hungary, and I'm a mock-up performer and an actress in Hungary, and I also uh, mock-up first assistant in uh, Digic Pictures. And uh, we've done a lot of stuff. And, uh, for example, you can recognize me from the Witcher Night to Remember trailer because I played that Brusa in it. And that's all for now. Awesome. Nosh? Uh, hey everybody, I'm Noshir. Um, you can call me Nosh. Uh, I'm an actor who happens to do a lot of performance capture and voiceover work in video games. Um, glad to be here. And Mark. Hi, I'm Mark Mariso. Uh, I've got uh, a lot of experience doing motion capture uh, from the technical side as an animator and motion editor um, on different uh, game projects. And I've worked with a few guys on this panel here before. And, uh, you know, I'm just interested in trying to translate a performer's performance onto a character's body. Awesome. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, so our first question is, uh, how did you all get started and find a way into performance capture slash video games? Um, so why don't we uh, throw this one to Tom first? I was uh, the in-house performance director at the Vendi Games um, in the early 2000s, and we had a a license for American Idol, but as a dance game. And so the company said, oh, we need to hire a choreographer and we need to have bits of dance put together that a player can yeah. add on. And um, I had a background in movement and dance, and I knew some choreographers. And they said, okay, we're gonna do this thing called motion capture. So go down to House of Moves. And um, I went to do the recording and I got in there and my background is in theater and movement and acting and stage and doing it. I just said, oh my God, this is for me. This is for me. So um, I do a lot of voiceover in games as well, but I've been specializing in performance capture. Awesome. Um, what about you, Mark? How did you get started? Um, I went to school for 3D animation. I thought I wanted to be a, I thought I wanted to be like a 3D animator for video games. Um, and I got uh, a project where um, I had to do a lot of animation and then someone just kind of threw out the word motion capture. And I said, what's that? And uh, I ended up just kind of figuring out um, motion capture technology because there was a stage nearby that allowed me to come and just train on there and actually had to teach myself a lot of things because there weren't any classes or anything for that uh, at the time. And uh, at one point I just said, you know what, I want to do this for a living. And so I actually reached out to a company that did um, like pre and motion capture as a service uh, out here in Los Angeles. And I just said, I didn't, I kind of just said, I want to work there and you're going to let me work there. And they, they said, okay. <laughs> and so I flew out and uh, started working on, um, on my first project, which was Resident Evil 6, um, right on set on stage. And it was, uh, it was fantastic. So I kind of, my story is a little weird and lucky. Um, it's not the same route that a lot of people end up taking. 
thinking. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, what about you, Susanna? Yeah. Um, so the first job, uh, it was uh, it was the crew, and uh, they called me for a casting. But I didn't know what was the job exactly because that time I didn't know what motion capture was it. So uh, yeah, and uh, they chose me for uh, all three characters in the cutscenes. And uh, after that, uh, they started to call me uh, also at Digic Pictures to work. So from then, it was eight years ago. Uh, from from then, I work for them mostly. That's really cool. Uh, what about you, Bobby? Uh, it was. 20 years ago, uh, going into there was the PlayStation 2 was going to come out, and we were doing. I was hired to work on a, a sports game called Knockout Kings, and I'm not sporty, not really into sports, um, but uh, I was a, I was a young animator, and uh, the lead animator there at the time was this guy Jason Greenberg, who uh, is a director at Infinity Ward now, and uh, he would he brought me to a mocap stage, and there was a professional boxer there, and we. Back then, we would get in the suits a lot, so we would pretend to be his trainer. And uh, this guy gave us a whole suite of like boxing moves. And um, I basically started being trained on on how to, you know, make uh, gameplay with motion capture. And then that turned into making narrative sequences and cinematography. And uh, over the last twenty years, we uh, really tried to get better at doing that. Um, so yeah, just kind of one thing led to the next. That's incredible. Uh, Noosh, how about you? Uh, well, I started in New York with theater, came out to LA for TV and film. Um, and uh, I booked a guest star on a Disney XD show that required uh, that my role be a martial artist. So um, I got to do all my own combat and stunts and the stunt coordinator was like, hey, do you want to be a stunt guy? And I was like, no, I am not. <laughs> I'm not cool enough to be a stunt guy, but I'm an avid gamer and I'd love to um, get into motion capture because I've like, I know that's a thing. And uh, he introduced me to a friend of his. Uh, so the, the stunt coordinator was Mitch Gould and he introduced me to uh, Dan Southworth who ended up uh, bringing me in kind of last minute to do combat stuff for uh, a project that would turn out to be the Order 1886. Um, and from that, uh, I got to meet Jackie Shriver, now Jackie Sladek, and she was kind enough to kind of just bring me in for all kinds of other projects and that led to PCAP work and eventually to voiceover and all that stuff. So I've been very fortunate. How about you, Marta? Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, I was, it was really random. Um, basically I was working for a startup. Uh, I didn't go to drama school or anything like that. I went to business school. And uh, I was working for a startup here in London and we would uh, get about a hundred pounds a month to spend on any kind of course. They would just, this was like a little personal development budget that they would have because that's so, you know, fashionable with tech startups uh, next to the bean bags, bean bags. Um, but yeah, so I was like, well, I've just gotten back into acting. I was part of a bunch of immersive theater productions. My zombie game was on point. And I was also uh, really, really, I'm, I've always been a gamer. And so I was like, well, maybe I can learn a little bit more about, you know, motion capture. I was aware that it was a thing. So I Googled, I found an introduction to motion capture, of course, and I went to try it out. It was only one day. And I was like, oh my God, this is it. This is, I love this. This is, and I, you know, I got into it, I think just through sheer determination and everything, just absorbing everything to do with the medium, with performing for it. Um, it, it was just, it wasn't like one of those things where I just got the role and then, then continued. It was a much slower burn, but, you know, enjoy the journey. Yeah varied experience all across the board um <clears throat> thank you all so much for sharing that so our next question um is what inspired you to become a performance capture performer um so um susanna do you want to start uh well i think it's it's not a really great question for me because i the first i didn't know what motion capture was it 
So, so I think I skipped this question because, you know, from now on I do this and uh, yeah, before that I didn't know what was it. So yeah, I skip. How about you, Nurse? Uh, well, <clears throat> I've always been an avid gamer and uh, I think one of the first games I remember seeing where it was clearly performance capture was uh, Star Wars Force Unleashed. And um, I just thought that was such a cool, cool thing. And the idea that you can, you know, play like essentially all the games that we'd play as children and get paid for it and get to run around in a Lycra onesie was just like the most crazy thing I'd ever heard of. Um, I, I mean, I, I didn't start off as an actor and I kind of came into acting by accident, but that was kind of the perfect blend for me of uh, combining my love for games with my love for theater. Um, Cause essentially I found that performance capture was uh, a really expensive high-tech version of black box theater. Um, and I've kind of been doing it ever since, so. Except that it pays. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> that is a nice uh, bonus. Um, so our next question is, um, leaning more towards the business side of things. Um, do you need to live in a specific city or specific cities to do performance capture? Um, Mark, do you want to start? So it's, it's very obvious that there are hubs in which uh, this kind of work takes place, um, and, and specifically pre-COVID time period. So you know, you've got um, California, Vancouver, um, there are some budding areas up north in the Washington area, Chicago, New York, um, and some in Florida with uh, some of the bigger game studios with that for, for like professional sports and stuff like that. Um, but now, uh, post-COVID, now people are looking at solutions and doing this anywhere. So now you have a, a lot more uh, mocap and performance capture setups that are smaller, more mobile, and uh, that's becoming more of a priority just to different developers and different, and different groups. Um, so now it's not, and of course there's London and you know Centroid and all these other places. Um, Montreal, Mont awesome. Montreal. I've never been to Montreal. Um, so so yeah, there's now there's uh, mocap performance captures happening a lot more places now than there ever had been prior to COVID. COVID's really forced people to just say, you know what, maybe we can't go to LA uh, or can't go to Vancouver, Montreal, you know, wherever else. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing a lot more. Uh, versatility and location now than yeah. ever before. I would like to add that, that uh, add to that answer, which is even pre-COVID, the cities where they do motion capture don't necessarily purely correspond to cities that are big film and TV hubs. There yeah. are actually motion capture studios in in various places that you know don't necessarily have a big film industry. So it's worth doing your research for where the studios actually are. Uh, Post-COVID, I, I happen through work to also have one of the inertial suits and it's so varied now that I've actually done some work in this room. In what are those, an inertial suit basically has sensors in it. It's powered, doesn't need the cameras around it. Um, but it's literally anywhere it'll work these days to keep the projects moving. Awesome, thank you. Uh, our next question is, um, how do you get a performance capture audition? Who, uh, how about, uh, Tom, would you like to start? Yeah, um, I work uh, with casting directors normally who set most of it up for me, although um, uh, I sometimes add people in that I know, um, voice over agents also, but generally uh, I work with a casting director named Emily Schweber and another, Lisa Zambetti, and um, uh, they'll, they'll put it out on something called Breakdown, which is the normal kind of casting route here in Los Angeles. And, you know, the main ones, Los Angeles, New York, um, in London, I've done a lot of auditions in London. It's through agents also, Spotlight. I worked with um, Dan Hubbard over there and Amy Hubbard. Um, generally, the more high profile projects uh, want really better actors. Um, so, 
you know, people always ask me, what is the what what is the main thing I should study for? And I'm sure we can get into this more, but it really depends on what kind of performance capture actor you are. For, for what I do mostly, number one is your acting. So I always encourage people, you know, really, uh, really work on your acting. Number two is usually the voice, then motion uh, along with that, of course, your physicality. But, um, um, but there are other, you know, kinds of uh, motion capture jobs as well, creatures, stunts, pure movement, walk cycles, things like that. So, you know, it really depends on what your specialty is, what kind of roles you're going for, where you get auditions. There are, if there's a motion capture studio, like Marta said, in small cities, outside of major hubs where there are game studios, a lot, a lot of times that game company may hire local actors, local movement people, local stunt people uh, for motion capture work. Um, so it's really making an alliance, getting a contact with whoever at that studio is responsible for bringing in talent and booking talent. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and that kind of leads into our, our next question, which is, are there performance capture specific demos? Um, so in other words, is there a specific demo you should have to be a performance capture uh, artist? Um, uh, what about Bobby? Would you want to take that one? Uh, it's kind of like, it's kind of how just Tom described it. Uh, for, for more stunt related stuff, um, you kind of got to look at what what we're, what kind of game you're making and what you're going to hope for is to see a stunt person and actor because they kind of have to do both things on a day um, that has that skill set or can fake it well on the spot. Um, and uh, I mean, we've been doing it for a long time, so we have a list of wonderful people like Nashir that you can you can count on to solve these problems with you in a day. Um, and, uh, and yeah, sometimes we end up, you know, looking at, at reels. Sometimes we go through YouTube, honestly, if there's some really specific thing, uh, we'll, and we found someone who's doing it in their backyard for some reason. I mean, we're interested. Um, like parkour, but, uh, that's but, a good one. You know. But usually it's a stable of, of people that are, are working in this industry. I mean, at this point, you know, they, they've been on a lot of games. They have a lot of experience. They have a reputation. Uh, we do have casting directors, and we we will we'll take a long shot on someone making phone vids of themselves doing something rad, like if if uh, if we happen to see them and it works out. So um, it's really kind of uh, it can go either way, but it usually goes with I'm gonna hire Nashir. You know, <laughs> Nashir, do you want to speak a bit about uh, what you put in a a, a performance capture demo? Uh, I I'm happy to, and um, uh, I hope I don't um, speak out of turn or uh, upset anybody with what I'm about to say. First of all, I don't have a, a PCAP demo, um, and I found that a lot of places kind of um, market this idea of like, we'll build you a PCAP demo where you run around in your Lycra onesie and assassinate people from behind and do all these ninja roles and stuff. And, um, and all of that is great. And like Bobby and Tom have said, there are specific types of performance where it is purely a physical thing. Can you defy gravity or can you not? Um, <laughs> <laughs> however, I have found that as an, as an I'm gonna speak as a performance actor uh, versus a stunt man. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that I'm an actor who can move, but I think without like stroking my ego too much, I think one of the reasons that I've managed to work as much as I have is because even if I am doing combat or movement-based stuff, I'm bringing character and emotion to what I'm doing. I'm not just running around trying to show my physical badassery. So to that, to that end, what I've found in speaking to a lot of um, video game casting directors is it's not so important that there be a, a a reel of you running around in a mocap suit. What is important is, do you have a reel showing that you can act? Like, can you 
can you connect with the viewer and make them feel something? Can you feel something and in your performance, bring that across the screen to me? Because if you can't do that, it really doesn't matter. Um, there are a ton of incredibly talented stunt actors out there uh, who would love to get into motion capture. But I think the thing that, the reason that there are people like um, South Austin and, and these other performers who can do all of it is because they're not only incredible movers, they are very gifted actors. Um, so I would just encourage folks to not put too much onus on the physical side of things because you've got a whole slew of pro stunt guys who are ready to bend the laws of physics in ways that you didn't even think you could. But no one can be you. And so learning to bring your truest self to your performance and putting that in a demo is going to be, in my, in my estimation, what gets you hired. I just want to slightly throw a spanner in the works there from a European perspective, um, simply because because I 100% agree with what Nos just said. Um, that said, in Europe, it's an odd thing because we don't have such a strict delineation between actor and stuntman. And we have this middle ground called SPACT or special action, which is kind of where also, I live. I'm, I'm quite a physical actor. I love my swords and lightsabers and, and fisticuffs and all that kind of stuff. And I love being able to, you know, express that while bringing character to those movements, just like Noah said. Um, so I do have a performance capture reel, but that is, it's kind of split into, hey, look, first of all, I can act. And then second part is, look, I can also move. The acting is definitely the more important thing. And to be honest, I wouldn't have even brought this reel up because to me it was more of a, hey, I, I happen to have enough footage from the volume, let's make something of it. I wasn't out there trying to get it, but uh, I, I happened to, you know, just last week I was in, in, uh, in Paris where I got booked off of my performance capture reel, which was very odd, but they were also looking for somebody who acts and has that who can act and bring gravity to this character, but also can handle what was actually an intensely physical role. Uh, but it was very crucial that there were deep character moments that broke through the physical strain. And believe me, in literally 100 degrees in a suit, there was real strain. But yeah. That sounds intense. <laughs> yeah, and, and let me just say, Marta, I agree with everything you're saying. Um, 100%. And um, yeah, I, I do have like a, a movement or action reel that is like my gun work and some of my combat stuff. But, um, but like you said, I think the acting is what gets you hired. If there's a specific requirement physically, then that other part of that demo is helpful. But um, yeah, to, absolutely. You know, uh, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, it's, it's, oh, I was gonna say in, in Europe, it kind of just they're still looking for people who can do both essentially there that it's Absolutely. also because that, yeah. that, that's everything i mean you you need to know a stable of, of problem solvers like all people who can do all different kinds of things and that's one of the things that's wonderful about someone like Nashir is he, he can uh but we've had him play children we've had him play old people he has been boss fights he has uh danced like a drunken college student um, and and he can he, he can he can give that to you. And I, I tell my our production manager Carla, if we're gonna have a big day and I need a lot of people, I mean that's like so we need to pack the right Swiss Army knife for the day, you know. So I'll tell her like I need all the crayons. I'm gonna need all the colors. Um, and so that means I might need some people who are just very physical. Some people who you know if they run and flip in the air, they fly. They defy gravity. Uh, like Siri Booker is a great example. Like, like the kid can fly. Um, so, uh, you know, and then there, there might be other things where I need someone to be funny or I need someone to ad lib like maybe three, four hours of civilian stuff. And like, to me, like I think of Kevin Dorman, like right off the bat, you know, like, man, can that guy just ad lib fun stuff all day long for you? And like, that just makes your job easy when you're like action, awesome, cut. Um, so that's, that's kind of how you want your day to go. You want it to be, you know, as, as fun as possible and you solve the problems together. 
um, and, and communicate. It should be a good time, in my, in my opinion, if you're working with the right people and you can afford to have enough of them there to solve all your problems that day. Um, but, but yes and yes. And so, yeah, sometimes we look at reels. Sometimes you don't need one anymore because you're awesome. It's all, it's all, it's all good. There's no wrong answers in life. But, well, there I are. think like what Marta said, <laughs> note, you rarely get booked right off the reel because there's too much writing on it. You bring in a performer, you want to know how are they to work with? Are they reliable? And like Bobby said, we pull people that are reliable. We know they're pleasant to work with. They show up on time. You know, it's, it's amazing how much, how that basic stuff really counts. But I think that the reel is a great backup. It, it shows more of what you can do as a performer. At the end of the day, for a lot of what I do, it's the audition. It comes down, you still have to come in and audition, unless I really know you well, but mostly it's not just one person that gets to decide. Since games is such a team thing, a lot of times you see somebody you like, you want to bring them in, but you have somebody who doesn't know them and, they, and you have to go, hey, look at their reel. I've worked with this woman, I've worked with this guy, um, you know, and, they, and they're the, an animation director or they're somebody and they, or they're facial. And they say, oh, do you have anything with your face on it? Sure, right here. Here's their reel. It's easy to find. It's easy to find them. The actor needs a location. Do they have a website? Are they, you know, is there somewhere, is there like an airport where I can find them when I need them and I need to land and I need to have their materials at hand? Um, I think it's it's very important. And, and also to the specificity of what you do. What do you mainly want to do? On a lot of... of really big games, we do not allow principal performers to do any stunts because if they get hurt, if they twist their ankle, if their calves are sore and the next day they have to do seven dramatic scenes, we're screwed, right? And so you are strictly, we, we oftentimes will have a stunt double doing the scene literally right next to them or behind them at the, in the exact same timing. They're doing the face, the voice, they're even doing the body and the stunt double. Um, um, like in, in, in Jedi Fallen Order, we had Misty Lee uh, doing the Ninth Sister and um, we had TJ Storm standing right behind her. They were like a team of doing things exactly in sync and TJ is, is huge and carries himself in a massive way. And Misty's an incredible performer. So it was the mix of those two things happening in real time. That was like two performers, two very different skills. Just a quick note for Nosh. Uh, at our company, uh, they mostly work with stunt guys who are wonderful performers also. So, and they are on the top. So we've never found anybody else uh, from uh, any theater or any, uh, anybody from the film industry, uh, simple actors who were uh, just good at, uh, as the, the stunt guys. So we pre prefer them. Yeah, so it's a good note. Awesome, thank you all so much. That's a, a good segue into our next question. Um, which is, what is a performance capture audition like? Um, so could you all speak a bit about uh, what actually happens during an audition? Uh, Mark, I see you see you getting excited over there. Could you share a little bit about uh, your insight? Sure, sure. I, and and uh, so I come from a, a space, I was working um, with Jason Greenberg on like um, the Call of Duty franchises and stuff like that. So our audition process was very, probably different from, you know, maybe the, the type of, uh, uh, audition process that maybe some other like, directors or actors are probably used to. Um, so because Call of Duty is a very established franchise, a very established look, feel, sound, everything, um, really when we, when we pull people in for auditions for both uh, Infinite Warfare and Modern Warfare, um, a, lot of, a lot of this uh, audition was like, okay, how do you carry yourself? Like, because we know, we know all of our characters are going to be just outfitted head to toe with gear and weapons. They're gonna be carrying about 40 pounds worth of weapons on them. So an audition, we could, we'll, sometimes we stack gear on the, on the performer and then give them uh, replica weapons that would work like the real weapons. And we say, you know, like, hey, just be you. Show us you with all of that gear on and just look, uh, give us a presence, you know, like what you think this character is. And it's like, and that was like the first test was hand them a gun and see how they stand. 
And if, if that was pretty much, if you can get through that door, then we'll look at the rest of the audition, which involves line work, dialogue, um, some physicality, depending on the character and depending on the game. But we actually had a lot of people doing physical stuff during the auditions, but mostly it had aspects that were very classic, I'll call them classical, like, you know, doing dialogue at a table and things like that. Um, but we, because we know the brand so well, we had very specific tasks that we wanted to see the actors do. And we wanted to see how they presented themselves as that character when we tasked them with doing that, because they're gonna be doing it for 12 hours a day for two years straight. Uh, and we need to make sure you know, that they're up for the task and, the right, and they're, they're the right one for the task. So our casting audition process was, was similar to that, um, as opposed to like a table read type of feel thing to it. Awesome. You're doing, um, right now we're doing all of our auditions online on Zoom, which is an interesting challenge. Normally, normally my auditions, uh, we do what's called a slate, where we'll have the performer say their name, and then we'll see them stand in profile, full body shot. Um, because a lot of times we're looking for very different kinds of body. We might be looking for a very large person, um, a very tall person, a small person, super fit, you know, it just really depends. And um, then I'll ask them to do a character walk <clears throat> because number one, the animators want to see, can they actually walk? Um, what is the rig going to look like when put on this frame? And then also I want to see them walk in character. I want to see how um, they're going to physicalize. I can't tell you how many people blow it right there because they don't take it seriously. They just slump around, um, think about, that's why I say in character, like think about this character. If they're, like Mark said, the military character with a lot of stuff around, they're not gonna just kind of like, you know, slump around back and forth, like, oh, just show my body, no. Uh, then usually I do, I'll do two scenes with an adjustment, and then a lot of times I will end with an audio test, which is a couple of battle cries, battle shouts, because in performance capture, you have all these different departments for a lot, a lot of times that you have to satisfy and that are gonna look and that are gonna weigh in. You have animation, you have narrative, and you have audio. And um, they have to be satisfied that the performer can handle all of those, particularly if you have a good narrative actor and they might be even physical, but they're gonna have to do a lot of battle shouts in the booth and they can't do it. They can lose, you know, not, not get the job for that very reason. I just wanted to add that during my first audition, I had never been so extremely aware of what my arms are or are not doing. I've never felt so aware. <laughs> it was really awkward. Uh, yeah, Tom, Tom nailed it. Uh, just, you know, basic motion. Um, if you're doing combat stuff, we want people who have some experience doing that or look natural doing that. Um, yeah, there's ours for, for more major parts, uh, they might look just like a Hollywood audition or a theater audition, because you're going to kind of come into the space and use props. Um, sometimes we'll really look at your base locomotion and, um, your, uh, voiceover ability, because as it turns out, I mean, you might be in four or five scenes in a, in a video game, but you might have 4,000 lines of dialogue. Uh, that happen over gameplay, and uh, sometimes people uh, forget that once you remove how cute you are from the equation, is your voice great? Um, you know, do people feel what you're doing? And that that's that snags up a lot of people. Um, so uh, we try to do our research and narrow it down. Uh, but yeah, if people come in and audition, and uh, there's usually two two full scenes to do, and then maybe a voiceover test. Uh, and that, that gets us to the process of narrowing it down. Yeah. Can, I, can I add one thing? No. Um, <laughs> so uh, I've actually also had the chance to be uh, like a reader for, for some performance capture auditions. And um, so if it's a, if it's a live in-person audition, oftentimes uh, as a reader, what I was asked to do is um, because a lot of these folks are coming from on camera, right? And in on camera, 
the focal point is, is, is set. But in performance capture, that camera can be anywhere. And often that camera is the player, which means that the camera is literally wherever the player deigns to go. Um, so I would do things like uh, in the middle of the scene, be talking about something and take a crouch or walk around, like force the other actor to physically be present, not like not to force them to do artificial or um, kind of like hokey things to mocap their audition up, but to see, can you physically engage with me and stay present in the scene, but, but live in it, you know, in three dimensions versus just kind of like planting your feet and delivering your, your acting exposition. And that ability to find the internal performance reason why you, for example, crouch down next to this person or go look out the window um, I think separates the really fantastic performance capture artist from the person who wants to show you that they can do mocap, if that makes sense. I agree. Yes. But uh, I wanted to highlight, <laughs> I wanted to highlight something that both Tom and, and, and Bobby said, though, uh, on the vo vocal part. Um, obviously, the, the, it depends on what you're fo trying to focus on as a mocap performer. Do you just want to do more in-game animation, locomotion, stunt work, where the face and voice don't really come into play? That That's one thing, and that's a whole other set of skills. But if you're doing performance capture, do not underestimate voice, in especially in video games. Uh, film, again, could be slightly, mm, but you will never scream as much as you will scream consistently in a video game. And so when you have the time, especially now, I've been dedicating a lot of time to actually training in vocal extremes uh, because I don't speak to as many people. So even I'm more silent than ever. So it's so important for you to get some education to how to push your voice to an extreme, to, to scream and keep it healthy and safe and to be able to, like Tom said, you could blow your audition because you're you're going to those places in such a way that anybody in the room can hear. You're not going to be able to keep that up for three days straight. Incredible insight. Thank you all so much. Um, our next question is, um, what is the hardest part for you about your job? Um, Susanna, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Um, I think... Um, you know, in, uh, in our studio, it's a little bit different because uh, usually uh, they work uh, with the same four people or a little bit more. Uh, so for us, uh, the hardest thing is, I think, uh, that we get the lines uh, on the spot. So usually if, if, it's a, if it's a longer scene, I mean, uh, with a lot of lines or something, uh, they can send it uh, over to us uh, before the shoot. But if it's uh, just a few sentences and, uh, and um, for example, 10 sentences, we have to learn it on the spot uh, while they are calibrating us and putting on the markers and, and, um, and stuff like that. So. Um, so I think, and when we also get the any and any info of the character on the spot. So I think for us this is the this is the hardest part to uh, because you have to learn quickly. You have to find out how would you like to do the character quickly. Uh, how does it work? Uh, you have to uh, watch if you can if you have any info about how the character looks like. Uh, you have to try to match your movement to it. And, um, and for example, uh, in Hungary, as we can, as I see other actors, for them, the hardest part is uh, controlling their body. Uh, and uh, yeah, because, because in Hungary, uh, the educational system is uh, not using uh, on, on stage and, and on, on, anywhere uh, how to use your body so uh, you have to really uh, learn to control your hands as Marta said and uh, and uh, not to uh, do any 
thing like uh, rolling from your one leg to to another and uh, and yeah and be and be consistent with it. So yeah, I think this is the hardest part. Awesome. Uh, what about uh, some of the rest of you? How about uh, Mark? What's the hardest part of, of your of your job? Honestly, bro, uh, that answer changes every week, and it's going to change at every job I'm I'm, I'm working at. Um, what I can say, well, when I worked with like Tom on uh, Battlefield Four, uh, the hardest part of my job at that point was just trying to make sure that Tom had all the set pieces that he needed for the sets for the actors to interact with, because we had some pretty extensive set builds um, just to, just to, just to work those scenes out. And they had to be uh, kind of performance safe, um, to a degree stunt safe, mocap effective, which means you have to be able to see through it. And Tom needs to be able to tell the actors uh, to do what they need to do. So all those aspects, all those pieces need to be in there. And I just always have these nightmares, I mean, these dreams about these, uh, this car that we had to build. It was so intricate. <laughs> it was so large. Um, so the, I remember and, that and, car. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's it fantastic. An stool as the steering wheel. Yes. <laughs> um, so you know, and 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 the hardest. I'm I'm never really resentful of the hardest part of my job at any given moment because for me, kind of like what Bobby was talking about, mocap is purely problem solving. That's all it really is, and I enjoy problem solving. So, you know, if I'm if I'm building this set out and Tom's like. And Tom just has nothing to say about it because it just works so perfectly. Great. Then I've done my job because there's no complaints. Um, these days now, now I'm dealing with water, and that's that's just a challenge in itself. Um, so it's always the problems are always going to change. And uh, you know, you ask me next week, it's going to be a different answer. Yeah, there's no, there's just no end to the problem. No, there's no, there's never, there's never it, been. It's everything. Like you need to know before the shoot day, every person that's going to be in what you need to shoot, whether, what they're going to yeah. touch, does it need to be markered? All the sets have to be delivered. We need to be able to mock those up. Got to make maps for everything because time's a factor. Maybe I got 25 minutes to build this set. So that means I got to hand two people like, here's my maps. They're going to stand here. They need to get on that. And while you build that, I'm going to go over here and talk to this person about this. And it's, it's popping all day and you can't let up. Um, and because you're only going to get, you know, on a small title, you might get eight, 12 shoots. On, a, on, on one with a budget, you might get 80. But either way, it's not enough. Um, so uh, you, 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 you plan all that stuff. You do your best on the day. You, you tell everyone what they need to know. You wait to see what they bring to it. You edit on the fly and, and try to make the best thing and harvest all the best ideas. And then it's not even done. It's not like you're gonna wait for the negative, like it's animation. So it has to be processed onto the rigs and that's gonna ruin it. And like, then uh, it needs to go into a format that can go into a video game and be rendered in real time. And it's gonna have a thousand bugs. And by the way, this industry is really collaborative. So everyone's gonna say everything. They're gonna change it and noodle it. And change All that. true. And yeah, so all it's, true. it's just absolutely relentless. So which part is the hard part? All of it, every day for like 20 straight years. Like, but it's, it's a good time. So, yeah. I think, you know, for me, the hardest, it's not, it's challenging, but it's a great challenge. And one of the reasons I love working in games is finding out what the team wants and translating that to the actors. Um, that's why I'm like actor whisperer. That's really kind of my title. Um, uh, but I have evolved a kind of process and, um, and when it doesn't happen, I, just down the line. But I do a thing called workshop where uh, me and my producer, we go, we meet with the writers and the team and we go through scripts really on. We come through the scripts, we ask a question, we flush out things dramatically that aren't clear. Next phase is we do what we call blocking rehearsals, where we might have members of the team, we might use ourselves, we might have local actors, and we'll do a kind of early staging for blocking of what the scene might look like. And right then and there we find out this scene isn't going to work at all, or this scene is way too long, or this is a repeat, uh, this is now the second repeat of the same scene again. We gotta, we've got to change this up. And so that by the time 
we get to the actual shoot, the one that's going to go in the game, we've really, it's like a garden, we've really turned over the soil, everything is ready, we know, we've tried out. I've heard film directors say, the reason we rehearse, the reason we do so much planning down to the moment is so that we can improvise when we're shooting. And I think that really is the ultimate truth. Powerful insight. Thank you so much. Uh, our next question um, is, okay, uh, yeah, our next question is, how is uh, performance capture work different from on-camera work? Um, so, Marta, would you like to start? Me? Uh, yeah, sure. So, I think, well, one thing I'd like to highlight first is one thing Nosh said, which is the camera in motion capture in, in a digital environment can literally be anywhere. You know, the, wherever the gamer chooses to look at you, whatever angle. And so you need to be very much aware of that. At the same time, these ultra close-ups like this, they more or less... I, they do exist in games, cinematics and things like that, but they are very rare. Um, and so therein is the first big difference, which is you have a much wider viewpoint, much like more, I guess, you have a 360 environment that you, it has to sell, your performance has to sell from every single angle, no matter, no matter how close or how far the, the player or that camera is. Uh, whereas in, in movies, you can cheat a lot of things very easily because of framing. You can have, you can do certain things out of frame. You can uh, convey very, very detailed emotion with just this, with just your eyes, just a big close up. You don't, at least at this point in time, you don't really get that luxury um, in, in motion capture. And that's why understanding your body as pretty much everybody on this panel has said understanding physicality the physicality of the character is so so important because you you can never afford not to to do that with your entire being in motion capture whereas in in you know in film you have well you have other challenges in film I'm not saying like oh mocap is so hard and film is so difficult both have their challenges um uh, with film, for example, it is about how well you emote, how well you can work the camera, and 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 that is an art in itself. Um, but those, to me, in my from my perspective, are the biggest differences. Um, it's it's. But at the end of the day, it's still all acting. If you're a good actor, you'll be able to act in both. If you're an actor that's aware of their bodies, of their body bodies, what multiple body. <laughs> Uh, you will be able to get a good final result. Always serve the character. And also, uh, I think uh, the big difference is uh, you can also, in film, you can also cheat with editing. And, uh, and maybe it's just in our, because we usually do just cinematics, but uh, for example, uh, the scenes uh, are in full from beginning to the end. Because in, in, in cinematics and in in, a, in motion capture, it's not that easy to uh, to edit and uh, and um, because of yeah the framing and everything. So uh, you have to you have to start from the first line, then you have to finish it, and you shouldn't stop in the middle. That oh my god, I fucked up. I'm sorry or something like that. But and because it's 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 it won't it won't work. So I think that's also a big difference. We actually like to shoot. Uh, in continuity, like a like a, a scene as like a like a play, just because um, it, it tends to ground the actors to each other and and, and make continuity when editing. Because uh, on on the titles I work on, we do edit some games. I haven't worked on a game that doesn't have camera cuts in a long time, but they exist. Um, so yeah, so some people just w won't have it. Some some teams actually do bring in a virtual camera now, so the actors know how it's being framed up. Um, but that's just a choice because you can, yeah, I mean, obviously I'm an animator and animating a camera exactly how I want it later to me is less hassle than also choreographing a camera person on the day and worried about what it looks like. We can just have these people do this naturally and then figure out how to cover it later. 
I think that's the fundamental difference between film is they have to know how they're covering it on the day. Whereas all I have to worry about is, do I believe this performance? Do I believe that they are using this space how they, how they should? Um, and then I can go later and figure out, do I want a close up on this or is it better as a wide? Like that, that's a huge luxury that I have in this industry, you know? So uh, yeah, Nash was gonna say something. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> so I, I guess if, uh, if an actor is used to working on camera, um, the camera reset, the time it takes to move from position to position and all that other stuff in mocap doesn't happen because the camera is digital. So you're not gonna like run a part of a scene and then have a cut and go to your trailer and go hang out while they take like 40 minutes or an hour to set that up. That's gonna go, there is no, there is no downtime. Um, and that also means that especially if you're, a, if you're in a physical performance, there's no camera reset. So um, sometimes that means that you'll do the same scene 15 times in a row with minimal gap, right? And so that, that's a, it's, it behooves the performer to have the physical stamina to be able to do that, for example. Um, another interesting thing about performance capture versus um, on camera, you have this HMC on your, on, your, on your face. So you're wearing this helmet with this camera pointing right at your schnoz in the most unflattering way possible. And it's like hanging like a foot or more off of your face. That means, for example, if um, if I'm supposed to be using like uh, a rifle or anything with an optic or anything like that, and I bring my gun up to my face, if I get like full cheek weld, which is what I should be doing, that optic is now like smack in the middle of that HMC, and you know they have to cut because I just ruined the take. Uh, similarly, this, 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 anything like that can ruin the take because they need that continuous facial capture. Uh, so that is different. Um, and the only other thing I'll say is, in on camera, those sets are for them, you know, <laughs> you hope are actually there. So if Marta bangs into a room and she's doing like dynamic entry and hunting for me somewhere in the house and I'm actually hiding in the house, the wall isn't there. We'll get maybe like two posts, right? And possibly a piece of tape or a ribbon or something to demarcate where that is. But there's no actual wall there. And a lot of on-camera folks, they'll literally, like, I can't tell you how many times we've had a cut because a, a rather inexperienced performance capture artist will look through the wall at what's happening on the other side because they haven't kind of solidified it in their imagination that this wall is solid and completely, you know, this wall is there. You can't see Marta on the other side of that. And in cases like that, you have to learn to use. So if I can't see her, I can hear her. And how does that change my performance? Because I'm not tracking with her eyes anymore. I'm, I'm not going to change my position and the way I hold my posture because now I'm listening for where she is, even though she's right there, you know, and those kinds of things put a lot more onus on the imagination of the performer and kind of making that world as real as possible for you because you don't have the time to kind of make those mental leaps in the moment if you're going to stay you know truly in the story developing a really strong mind's eye is is very very useful but i do want to make a note of um uh, film productions as well that and virtual production it, it is something that's not just useful for the mocap volume it's very useful on a green screen set having those same skills, green or blue screen, whatever, pick your color. Um, it's, it's something that's bleeding into a lot of big productions where it's games or movies or TV, even TV now has budget for these very complex virtual sets. And even though you see those, you know, like what they did with the Mandalorian where you have the real time, it's so good, I know, it's so good. Uh, and that is such a big resource, again, bringing it back into, oh, here's something, a visual reference everybody can have. I found it very useful, actually, to talk to anybody I'm in a scene with, uh, and the director and obviously the team, about any details they can give about the environment so we can actually all kind of be on the same page and see the same thing. It makes a, a big difference. But those are things you have to essentially uh, you know, worry about when, when, when you're on there. It's to you know, never be afraid to ask. Yeah, we even do, I'm, I'm much like coming up 
like Mandalorian virtual productions where people can actually see the digital environment. God, I hope we can uh, do mocap that way or, or, or not need mocap because of it. That, that, that will just be incredible. But going back to the lowest of low tech, even, even capturing someone running forward or punching, just having someone stand in front of them so they can make eye contact will give you a better performance. There's like a, you know, a first baby tip in, in uh, getting attentive locomotion or attentive uh, like aggro behaviors. Like someone angry is one thing, but someone angry at you is different, you know? Um, so uh, yeah, just little things like that, whether it's the environment or who they're supposed to be looking at, it's, it's important to sort of communicate those ideas or, or uh, make them as real as possible under the circumstances. There definitely is a completely different process for the actor. Um, I, I get it in the suit usually every production and you know for one more I do my Alfred Hitchcock um, and um, I'm always struck by how you come in and you strip away. You, you put on this cat suit, you take off your clothes, your costume is this neutral suit, you're wearing shoes, you know, bowling shoes, you, um, your face is turned into a dot matrix, your hair is put into a cap, and you cannot hide, you cannot hide behind a gesture, removing your hair or the costume. Um, I do a complete sound, breath, and movement warm up at the beginning of every rehearsal and every performance capture day because an actor, a performer really needs to be anchored and focused inside and bring it out. You know, there are various levels of subtlety depending on the game, depending on the face, how, how well defined the face technology is going to be for this particular game. So you have to be able to scale the performance a lot it may vary from game to game but um, it has to come from inside and then it has to be expressed physically and vocally as opposed to on camera where you're you spend a lot of time in makeup and hair and look beautiful you're in a stunning set um, you have an amazing costume on and then you're just told go say the lines incredible thank you all so much um we're just about out of time Thank you for submitting all your questions. We couldn't get to them all, but um, you know, if you have other questions, then feel free to um, you know post us in the chat. If we're available, we, we might be in the chat. You can always uh, you know reach out to people on socials. But before we go, um, I'd like to go around and get final thoughts from everyone. And um, if there's stuff that you're working on that you'd like to plug or where people can find you, uh, feel free to share that information as well. Um, so, uh, uh, Tom, would you like to go first? I'll just say um, it's so important to be adaptable. As I started to say, we're doing all our auditions on Zoom now because of COVID. Um, there are very different protocols on the set. Um, I read somewhere recently a quote that a person who is flexible is the person who is going to survive and thrive. And I think it's so true. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Tom K Studios, T O M K Studios. Uh, also on Facebook, Tom K Studios, and Tom K Studios at Gmail. Um, and I also do training and classes as well. So keep in touch. Awesome. How about you, Marta? All right. Uh, final thoughts is um, you shouldn't get into mocap because you're a mocap performer. It's, it's acting. All of it is acting at its very core, whether you're physical, not physical. And, and you'll see, you know, the trends and, and archetypes of different characters. You might be closer to them. You might not. Doesn't mean there's no space. There, there isn't space in this industry for you. There absolutely is. But work on your acting first and then get into everything else. And I think it'll be a, a much more pleasant journey for you overall. Um, and if you want to follow me, I'm on pretty much all the social medias at Mart Holio. Yes, for those of you who know uh, Beavis and Butthead, that is that reference because I thought it was cool in college. And that's it. That's all me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Susanna, what about you? Yeah, I think uh, I'll join Marta. So be a good actor because and be and try to be better and better 
and also uh, know your body and uh, learn your body to move because uh, I think this is also uh, really, really important. So I think that's all. And uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter, uh, uh, which is Alphabet Green. And on Instagram, you can find me Zhu.Rat, uh, uh, and it's uh, Z-S-U dot uh, R-A-C and Z. Yeah, it's quite hard, but you can find me on uh, Martha's, <laughs> Martha's uh, followers. And yeah, that's all. Awesome. And Mark? Yo, um, yeah, final thoughts. I would say that uh, regardless of what type of performer you are, um, uh, spend the time, if you want to go to auditions for physical work or go to auditions for more acting work, um, you should also spend the time kind of training and, and, and learning more about what you're doing. A lot of times I, I get reels all the time um, and like, oh, hey, can you put me in this shooter game, blah, blah, blah. And they showed me a shooting reel that looks, you know, not, not the highest caliber. Um, because they just haven't invested the time uh, in, in their self to just uh, get that skill to, to a level that they can portray it on screen or in mocap convincingly. So I'd say spend the time, learn the skill that you're looking for, whether it's technical, whether it's anim animation, whether it's a, a performance based or whatever, just learn it. Um, and I can be found on um, uh, Instagram at that mocap guy. And, uh, I don't know what's happening in the silent party, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's entertaining for some. Okay, but yeah, that, that's that's all I'd say. Awesome, thank you, Mark. Uh, what about you, Bobby? Yeah, you know, you, you guys have, have said it all. I mean, be, become an actor. It, it, this is just acting. How you capture it is not not necessarily relevant. Um, it, there is this. I don't think. I don't think this action thing's going away. Um, so if you can get good at weapon handling, gun handling, falling down, flipping, you're gonna get more work. Um, you know, it might be different kinds of work, might not be the work you expected to do with your life, but uh, bills come and work is cool. So uh, I, would, uh, I, I would round out your skills. I mean, take voiceover just as seriously as like, can you uh, uh, reload a rifle? because it's gonna come up and it's gonna be the reason you get called back for a lot of video game work. I mean, you, you don't, I mean, you might not be into guns, you don't have to be, but it's acting. Like, can you act like you are a super soldier from the future? Um, yes, and that's fun, that's a good time, you know. Thank you, uh, and Nosh. Motion capture and the technology in motion capture has a way of um, allowing a level of scrutiny that I think, um, as others have said here, uh, you can hide from in, in other mediums. Um, and I think uh, the really interesting thing is that motion capture allows you to play almost any role. Um, what becomes most important isn't that you can be somebody else, but that you are able and willing to be honestly yourself. Um, and that's the bad as much, if not more than the good. And if you can learn to tap into that, right, um, and not be self-conscious about it, uh, you'll go far. So beautifully said. Thank you all so much. Thank you again to our amazing panelists. Thank you for joining us. I'm at C. Askernies on Twitter and Instagram. And thank you. Enjoy your packs. We'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye. 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 Awesome. <laughs> Good luck. Take care. <laughs>